okay? It's a crowded place. It's my first Blender conference. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. So also it's the first time I'm speaking for people. So it's a combination that, you know, bear with me, okay, please. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. So the idea behind the talk that I, I wanted to, to share with you is that I think we are missing for tutorials or we are missing for some comments or we are missing for some in-depth uh, thoughts about how to get photorealism but inside architecture or any other um, kind of matter, you know? So the idea is to discuss how to think about um, the implicit subject, you know, like that, that thing that is not in the scene but we will have to think or imagine that it was there, so you, you can present your protagonist um, with an, an, a history, because the idea behind what I will explain is, I want to share um, architectural um, renderings without people. I don't like people, like in the renders, in real life, I mean, I like it kind of, <laughs> but in the renderings, I don't like it at all, so I'm trying to tell stories without people. That's the idea. So how to, how to do that? I need to understand what's happening with each asset. I will try to start with randomization. This, this is like a theoretical part that I, I completely did not prepare this today. No, this was something I made like three months ago and it was in the making. So randomization. When we think the random concept, even if we understand what it means, when we do it in 3D or we prepare it on, or we see it on maybe shows, TV shows, movies, for example, a street with uh, leaves on the street, what we will find is that the leaves are like spread evenly in the, like in, in, in the car side or in the street. So what we need to understand is what's happening with those leaves, why those leaves are there. And for example, elements like the wind, how the wind interacts with those leaves and how the currents or how, where those leaves will be placed. With this kind of assets, is the same. When we try to recreate a moment of reality, we will realize how little we really know about that. I mean, you can think how to make a chair or a door or whatever you, you, you want to make. And if you try and start doing that in Blender or in, well, in this case, in Blender, of course, after you finish that asset, you will find that it's not looking great. It's not looking nice. And that's why we, we are missing like that implicit element, that implicit subject that was affecting before that kind of asset. So we can only try to imagine how this element interacts with other, but um, the idea is that we forget how about the elements that are not there. And this is precisely these elements that activate and modify the asset we make. I don't know how to go back, but I will do like this. Um, real world references, of course, this uh, was already said like a thousand times, the idea of search for um, references outside, go outside with the camera and took pictures and whatever. You can do it inside, of course, it's the same that outside, but you can do it in your underwears as I do. So the idea is that search for every kind of um, material that you will create, search it first on reality, search it online, and try to see how those elements look when the weather went through those or when, I don't know, when the water interacted with those and those kind of things. So as you can see, the idea behind is to understand, go deeply with the thought of, of how the things happen in reality, how the world change the materials we are gonna produce. And this is something that I'm not seeing um, outside, like in, in every rendering. When I go and scroll on ArtStation or Blender Artist or whatever you, you scroll with, um, my idea is to find the best art architectural rendering, and I struggle with that because there is always something missing. Even on my works, when I see my works, is so, there is always something missing. Uh, I will show you my portfolio real quickly so you can see what I do. And this, of course, you already saw. <laughs> this is a sink that I created. 
and this is a render in Blender. And this is the, the, the photo that I took as a reference. So my idea was to create this render based on this photo and try to mimic everything. I think if I see this like in retrospective, I can see that maybe the chrome was not there. But you know, sometimes you need to finish the project because you will be working with it like for years. I will show you a project that I'm making for years and I'm still not happy. Uh, of course, this is a clay render. Uh, always when you create something like an asset, try to put it in a context. If you are creating this kind of facet or whatever, create it in a context that shows where the, that faucet is or where that asset is from where it, it comes and maybe you can try to understand the context of the design. In this case, I think it's great because you have like an old faucet in a modern design. And always try to have, and we will see later how to do it, try to have the camera as a view, camera as a, like a flying person and try to take as many shots as you can using a good lens and using the, the, the depth of field. Those three or four things will make you create a lot of content. So that's the idea. Uh, you can see both how, how it looks. I mean, it's really close, but it's not perfect. Okay, so then <clears throat> this is a project that I made in a low key environment. This, uh, I have more examples like with more light in case the light is not good here. But the idea behind it was to create something with low lights but good textures and try to understand how to do it. This was done in seven, eight days because I tried to create everything um, like modularly and we are gonna see now or after actually how those cans were created with the shader, how you can create one single can with one single shader and then you can instance that can as an empty or as an instance in another scene and every time you duplicate that can, you will have different, different label, different scratch and stuff, and that will be fun to see. Um, so of course, this was created in a time of confinement, like we all did, so you can see how depressed I was <laughs> during this time, like the, the cloth is not washed, I mean, I didn't have even cable or Netflix or nothing, so it was a really boring basement there. Um, and even I was counting the days, as you can see here, like, my God. Okay, so here's the can that we will see later. Another work that we can see is this one. This was the example that I was looking for. This is a house in the hood that I created for some, like, author of a book that wanted a, I don't know, a trailer. And this was created like a long time ago. You can see <laughs> in the street the same thing that I just said at the beginning was not done in this render. I mean, I was thinking about let's pick some renders from people on the web and criticize them, but I won't do that because, I mean, it's not my place. So I will take mine and I will destroy it because that's what I do. If you can see the, the leaves on the, on the, on the curbside on sidewalk, like it's, it's random because I didn't use any pattern, but it's evenly spread during, like, through all the, the, the sidewalk. So that's a mistake. And that's what I'm talking about. The, the same is uh, between the street and the curbside. They should be like, that's the place where the leaves should be. Or maybe here or here or here. You know, like you have to understand how the wind will go and flow through the street and how, the, I mean, this, well, I don't know why I do that, but I, I mean, it was an epiphany moment because I say, okay, let's put some leaves there. But here it was a mess, so I don't like this project anymore. So I remove it from my portfolio. That's another advice that I can give you. If you don't like, a, a, like your project anymore, or you think that this project is not good, remove it. Remove it for good and don't show it when you ask for work and whatever, no, no. Remove it because uh, if you can't sell it to, I don't know, to yourself, you will be not able to sell it to a client or to a potential, you know, um, employer. Okay, so going further, this was like the first of my really serious in interiors. And you can see here how I just, <laughs> how 
you know, the artists that are not like wanting to to create a lot of assets, it, they hide be, behind the, I created a minimalistic design, or uh, I created a uh, Nordic style. Like everything is Nordic now because I don't want to create nothing. So <laughs> that's the idea. And this is the idea. Um, even though I'm in love with wood floors, as you can see, as you will see in the next project, I mean, I think the wood shows a lot of the place. I mean, the wood, the floor, will show what happened in that place. How many people walk in that place. They were like people who lift the chair to sit, or like me, they just drag it away. So that's the idea behind it. And if you create scratches, don't create it everywhere. Just think where those scratches will be. Like they will be behind the table, they will be behind the chairs, but there, there's no place to put it like behind the, the thing that I don't know what, what it's called in English, behind, like below the window, uh, the stove, I think, I don't know. So the idea is think through the, the history of the, of the element, the history of the interior. Think what happened there, think the history and make the assets the protagonist. If you, if you create like an environment or like a history for each asset, you will have like an ecosystem of, of a little architecture design that you will be able to make little close-ups for everything. So that's, that's the idea behind the, um, the implied subject or in Spanish is sujeto tacito. is like, I don't know, the, 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 the subject that is there, but you don't name it. In this case, what, it was there, but uh, you don't see it because you already left or whatever. So when, when I, I thought about this, like I rounded up this idea was in the market and inside the, the Blender conference and I was checking uh, the tables and, and you can see that if I made you draw the table or make in, in Blender the tables now, you will make just wooden walls with, uh, I don't know, with the, the legs and whatever. But if you really see, and, and after when we, we are gonna go to have a, a drink or whatever, check the tables, check the history behind the tables. I mean, check the, 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 the peeling paint and the rusty screws and the small scratches. I mean, things that happened there. You, you can really see how many people were in those um, kind of uh, places just for looking. I mean, and that's the idea behind a great artist. If you are a good artist because you want to make art and make money or whatever or work in the industry, that's fine. I'm one of you. I mean, I'm not doing this out of order, but if you want to create the best art possible, you will have to start looking the, like what's happening outside. And I don't want to get philosophical, but this will help your life as well. No, no I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's not that. <laughs> um, okay. So going back to the first one, uh, artistic freedom. According to the famous di Disney paper, I mean, you guys, I'm ready, the, the, the ones who already know something about PBR, already read the, the, the Disney paper who led us to the PBR system that you are using now, or the principal shader actually. And in there, what they said is the, run, the roughness is one of the values inside the PBR. The roughness is what controls actually how, um, I don't know, reflective a surface is by, by creating this kind of bumpiness in the micro facet. But actually, it's not like creating e or simulating even angles like the normals or height. It's just creating different um, reflectivity on the maps. So in the Disney paper says that that's the only creative way or the only creative map that you can use however you like without thinking about the technical stuff. I mean, you can go crazy with that factor and that's because in there it hides the personality of each asset. But I will say that they were wrong. <laughs> no, no, I will not say that, but I mean, I will add that the, um, the hate map and the normal map there are also, I mean, even if technically you need to have a certain kind of map, like a normal map or whatever, I mean, you can tell the story of an asset with that piece of the map, like the hate map and the normal map. Those maps are even 
um, more important than the roughness mouth. But I, I mean, I'm I'm good with with both. But I I want you to 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 take it from here that you need to work or you need to work your roughness map a lot. I mean, sometimes with, I mean, with principal node setup in Blender, when you add a, a shader, you go control shift T on the principal shader and then pick all the, like the texture setup and you put it there and, uh, and that's it. And that's uh, the, the map. Well, no, you have to work on the roughness map a lot to make it good, look good. So, um, this is the way we will find the story we are looking for, okay? <clears throat> then, let's go with the Blender time. Let's go on Blender. I will show you some stuff, and let's see what happens there. This is the improvised part, so prepare for troubles. Okay, so this is the kind I was talking about. This is an asset that I created for the scene, for the basement scene, and you can see the nodes here. <clears throat> I prepared it. I took the time with frames and reroutes. You should thank me because this is not my workflow, you know? I will show you my workflow and this is not it. So, <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, the idea behind this can is that you can duplicate it, you know, a few times and the label will change and the, the way the label is built will change as well. And this will create like an infinite amount, if you want, of variations on these cans. And this works if you take this can and instance it in another scene. So the instance is like a ghost for the blender. If you duplicate this can, you will duplicate the mesh and everything that is inside. If you take this can and use it as an instance in another scene, you will have like a ghost of the same can you will have an improvement on, 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 on the capacity for Blender to render that can, and you will be able to duplicate it several times without losing any um, power on the, or, or adding any VRAM for the, for the GPU or whatever. So that's an, a good idea. And this happens, this, this shader works for the instance too. So how is this done? The idea is to create, I'm not, a, I'm not like Simon Thomas, he's the, like he, he really knows, I'm just uh, like goofing around with the nodes, but what I came up with is I have three random nodes here. I don't know if this is even seeable, like if you, yeah. So <clears throat> the idea behind the random nodes, even four I think, is that whenever you duplicate something, it will try to um, select from each of these random values. And the random values will be decided for a um, binary system of black and white. So if I put this object info as a factor with the random value on a color ramp, what it will happen is that if I duplicate the can, the next can will be black. And the next will be, like, it's a 50 chance probability of every can to be white or to be black. So that's the idea behind it. And I think if you know something about shaders, you know that from here, it just keep moving around. Um, so the same I did like four times or three, four times. And then what I just did is add like a label. So you have this label, you have this label, this label, and then a mix. And the color ramp was put it on that mix. So now, whenever I have like the chance to select everything, what it will happen is sometimes it will pick this one, like 50% um, of the time, and if I duplicate, in this case, we have the same. This is happening because the, the amount of probabilities on these labels are decided on where this color ramp is located. If you change the color ramp slider, like if you go more black than more mm, white, you will give the black or the white more chances to appear. So and that's why after everything you see here, what I created is a system that you can randomize almost evenly every can. So now you have the labels. What you need to do now is create the peeling. So that's why I went to the peeling. 
and the peeling was created, let me check where, here. So I do the same. <clears throat> the peeling is just a mass grave, I think, or, I don't know, or, or this texture, I don't know which, which is actually the texture for that. Even if I prepare this, I, I knew it. This will, ah, okay. So the noise texture is working like with the same principle, with the randoms, and it's changing its location. Instead of change like how it is, I just change it where it is, because the noise texture could work like in all the space for those guns. And that's why uh, or how I got this result. Um, I know that everything, like every every like conference had the questions at the end, but I know that this is like something I don't want everybody to get sleep. So do you have any questions on this regard? You can raise your hand. I mean, I, I don't care. We are okay? Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm explaining well then. Um, this can was here. This is the scene that we saw before. You can see all the instances that I have here. What I should do <laughs> is I should maybe go to the instance and make the size smaller so I don't have those kind of empties. But here you can see that the weight of the scene is not I mean, it's nothing. I can go to render view, and this is what I give my champ of faith, you know, because I press the render view, and now we see if this crashes or not. No, it didn't. Good. So, you can see how you can duplicate this can. This is an instance. You can duplicate the instance, and you will have automatically another can. And you can do this for all the assets you need to populate a scene. And you can see how I even work on the roughness to give personality to the Chrome. And I prepared a story. So every can had a story in the peeling, it's going down. What I will do now, if I took this project now, what I will do is I will um, create a, um, a gradient from, from the bottom to the top and peel the the can from bottom to top, I will add some kind of rustiness or some kind of things that affect thinking about the world, not just adding noises um, uh, uh, like a crazy man. And this is a wine called Angelica Zapata. It's the best wine in Argentina. So if you ever go there, go and taste it. It's really, really tasty. It's expensive, but for you, you will be fine. <laughs> um, okay, so. I will go to the presentation. And the last thing here, before keeping working with Blender, will be a few comments about feedback. Feedback, I have a YouTube channel. I'm not using it anymore. I mean, I'm using it like very low now, but I had some talks with some really interesting people in the industry. Like I, I talk with um, people you may know, like Sergi Cavalier. I mean, I don't want to say any names because maybe I will say it wrong, but a lot of people in the industry, and what they told me is the feedback. What happens with the feedback? Is the feedback good for you? Is the feedback bad for you? What should, do, what should you do with the feedback, with your work? Um, should, you should hear everything. You shouldn't hear nothing. Well, the thing is that the constructive feedback that you will, you will be looking for is not out there. I mean, you won't find it. Maybe you will find it sometimes from some people you respect, or maybe you, you don't. What I can advise is you just post and ghost. Like, put it there, close the gap on your mind, and then disappear from that. And let the work do its work. And don't let your ego or your thoughts like go in the middle of what should I do with this? Should I reply because someone says the normals are inverted and I should say no? No, no, no. I should, shouldn't do nothing like that. Yeah, the normals are inverted. Well, what can I do? I can't go and unpost it and repost it. So post and ghost. If you are happy with the work, post and ghost. And the other thing that I can advise as well is you should keep like notes on your oldies, on your old work. 
So this is, these are my old work that I will show you. This is the first interior scene that I did. This was my first like home and I created in Blender 2.42, something like that, like 2006. And you can see it's Blender Internal. For those who doesn't know what's Blender Internal, it was the engine before cycles. And it was very, very bad. So this is another a hallway that I created. Like this is the first hallway that I created. And this is Homero Simpson like going for a UFO, you know? <laughs> so you, you should keep this because that's the only way you will see how far you got. Because if you don't look at your old work and show it proudly, you will not ever see your present work or your current work as a good work. You know, look at this. I can even start to design this. It's, it's awful, but it's mine. And I stand it before it, you know? So now I post and ghost. Okay, so um, behind the next door, we will find this scene, and I will try to show you how I approach the, the, the shaders um, on each part. Um, you know, for texturing, the best way is to have everything UV, and who enjoys doing the UV? Somebody here enjoys UV? One, two, three, four, five, five? Okay, me neither. <laughs> but, but, look at this. This must be like in, in, a, in a forum, like this is a UV apartment. I never do this, I always work in box and project the mapping, but I, do, I did it for the presentation, so this is another thing that I did for you guys. Um, I will give you three add-ons that you can use um, to make it easier if you don't enjoy it as myself. And those add-ons are the next ones. Maybe you already know it, maybe you don't. But the first add-on will be text tools. Text tool is a great add-on for UV. It's awesome and you have, um, actually I use just one single thing on this add-on. So I'm saying it's awesome, but I just use this button that says rectify. Rectify will rectify everything, and that's magical because I don't need to go S, I, O anymore. So text tools, it's great. Um, Textual density, it's a great add-on. It will make every, every object with its own UV have the same textile density, and that's something that you should keep an eye on because the same textile density will allow you to have the same detail on the same close-ups. Do you guys know what textile density is? Yes, raise your hand. Yeah, that's a good idea. Raise your hand. One, two, yeah. Okay, textile density, what I will explain you <laughs> the best way as, as I can, but the idea is the amounts of pixels inside the UV grid or the UV textures um, will be defined by the, by the UV island. If you have a UV island taking everything, but it is a small part of the building, but it takes everything, you will have a high textile density. And if you, for example, now I'm explaining very, very wrong, so I will do it like this. This floor has this textile density, and you can see here is 0.64 pixels uh, per centimeter, right? If I go with, this, with the S, I scale this, what I will do is I will change its textile density, and you can see how the squares are little, so are going even, even, even little. What happens with this? We will have the, the texture that is in the UV will be repeated more times inside the floor. So more quality we'll have because a 4K um, texture repeated a lot of times in here, you will need to be super close to start seeing uh, the pixels. If you have the same texture, but your UV island is small, you will start seeing the, the, the pixels on that UV texture, right? So once you're happy with, the, with, with the UV island and with the textile density, you will have to check that, for example, if I decide that, that this is a good textile density for the floor and for the wood, but maybe the wall 
has a big UV and I will start seeing from this angle like the, the pixel from the wall, that will be a mistake. So the idea is to have the same pixel density on both uh, objects and this is what this add-on does. So let's select, for example, I will put it like this and I will take <clears throat> the wall. The wall has a texture density of 0.649. So I will calculate it again. Maybe I will scale it a bit. Calculate the texture density. You can see how it changed. Now it's 0.63. And then I will put calculate and set value and then calculate and select value. You can see how the set texture density value now got changed to this density that we have. So now we can go to the, this object, the floor, and we can just put set my textile density and that will do the, the work for you. So you don't have to make a balling no more. You can just select the textile density that you need and you can set it for all the objects on the scene. So that's a good idea. And the other one that I want to show you, I mean this, I, I'm sure you know it, is the UV Packmaster. When you are working for the game industry, you need to pack or you need to bake every texture set and then you need to pack it and do it in the, in the FBX to make it work for the game industry. That's the usual workflow. Um, now, I don't know, maybe it's the GLTF, it's not, not anymore the FBX, but what you can do here is you can pack everything in the UV island. So if you have one UV island outside of, of the UV grid, just put in pack, it goes inside the UV grid. And if you have like this, a lot of things, you can pack it and it will find the best, the optimized uh, space for each island inside the scene. So it will accommodate itself, everything in there, so you don't have to do the work. So for the people who, doesn't, or who don't enjoy this kind of work on UV, okay, this is a good um, way to avoid that problem because, I mean, I did this in 10 minutes. Okay, so which is the first part, like the, the first um, step to create a texture, you, we all know that with the Node Wrangler activated, we can go Control Shift T over this principal um, shader, and you will open the principal texture setup. Um, that is um, a way to tell you that you can pick all the textures that you need, and automatically will be put in the principal shader. Right. So let's. Pick, for example, the wood floor that is here. I think these are all the wood floors. Maybe this as well. And I will go principal text to And everything goes there in just one click. Um, I don't think that this is the proper floor anyway. So I will check. No, this is, no, this is not the proper. So I will take everything. I will go back. Ah, this is the one. This. This, uh, I think this one, and this one, and this one. Let's see. Okay, <clears throat> this is super, super big. So what we can do is we already have the UV map decided, so I don't want to mess with that. So I will take it from here and put it however I want. Now, the displacement is there, and it's super strong, so you can go down with the displacement and the bump, it's also super strong, so you can go even to zero. And from zero, that's another advice that I can give you, from zero you can start seeing what's happening. EV is not a good idea to use for the final rendering because EV is not, um, I hope Clement doesn't hear me, but EV is not uh, show, showing you the actual reality behind the bump node, so I, I recommend to go to Cycles View, and this is what you are gonna see. Uh, let me, yeah. So, from here, you will think that this is already done. You already have everything set up. You can go to the walls now. So no, the idea is that you don't have nothing yet. Um, what you will do is you will take this all over the way and start working with the ones 
that a blender doesn't recognize, that is the amine occlusion. You can put the, blend, uh, the amine occlusion here, multiplying to have a bit of distortion of the color, and you can start working through the um, maps. There is something really, really important behind the maps and the blending of the maps, and it's the, um, the mixing, or the color mix, or the math node, Every, every node has, has its own blending mode, and whoever uses Photoshop or whatever is already um, familiarized with this, but maybe when I started, what I do, or what I have done in the past is just going like this. Let, let's do it with a real example. So this is the roughness, right? As you can see, the glossy is inverted to create the roughness and it's set it as non-color data, of course. And let's add something else to play with. So let's add a color mix here. Let's add a image texture. I'm gonna look for whatever, I don't care. So maybe this stained liquid. You can see how the stained liquid is using the same UV as the, as the UV map of the floor. If you need, because you have a stencil of you have something to add on the floor, if you need to create another UV map, you can go here and add a UV map. You can put here, I don't know, um, stains. And then from here, you go input UV map, and Blender will let you select the stains UV map. So now, if you go here and go to the UV map editor, if you change these stains UV map, it will affect that texture, but the UV map that the other texture is using will remain the same. So you don't have to bother anymore. The only thing it will affect this UV map is the one you connected with this UV map node. Okay, so now let's put this as a non-color, of course. Let's add it here and <laughs> I want to know if any of you have found it themselves doing this. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, but if I found something that I like, I will remain there. Well, this is not a good, of course, a good uh, practice to do that. I have a resource to share as well. Let me, in my share folder, is the pixel math. I, I don't know if I can, I won't share anything. I'm just sh showing you which is the book. This is a, an, an NPR book, non-photorealistic uh, shading uh, book called N, uh, Pixel Math. It's out there. I mean, you can find, I think it's $9 or something like this. And it's a great resource to understand what's happening behind the blending modes. And I will show you just the first one. You have here the actual mathematics behind the factors, and you can see how the factor works as factor plus fact m equals one. So you can see how the slider from zero to one reacts on um, this um, mathematical equation. So we all know that zero is black and one is white. So that's how the blending mode works. If zero is black and it's zero, and it's, the slider is all <clears throat> in this, um, like is at the top of zero, you will just show the color one. That's the only thing that you will show. You will show color one. I will create really quickly just with colors to see. So <clears throat> with zero, you will find just the, the, the red, and with one, you will find just the blue. That's the idea, that, that's it, for the mix. This is just for the mix. <clears throat> so if you put these kind of maps with black and white, let's crunch the contrast a bit. What it will happen is that you will have black and map spots, and the black part will be the first slider, and the white part will be the second slider. So this is the principle behind this kind of blending mode on the mix. So if you put it here, you will see blacks and whites, and you can control it 
however you want or you need, right? This is the idea behind it. But if we are gonna use this together instead of a mix, because what you can do here is you can put like roughness like this, and you can try to put uh, this map as a factor, and now you can decide in the white spots on, the, on, the, on that alpha map or what can you affect. Like, okay, in the black, in the white spots, I want some blue, or in the white spots, I want some red or whatever. I'm not using this like this at all. What, I'm kind, what I can do is I can take the same reroute node to the color two, and now I have like the same kind of um, texture on both. But what I can do now is I can add like a RGB curves here on the, on the second slot. And if I go down, I can start creating some extra smudge on the roughness map. So that's the idea behind this kind of um, working through the roughness. The most you work with this, more personality it will have the floor or it will have whatever you work with. And I can advise something else. Whatever you do, you, you do with the roughness map, I think you should do it as well with the color. So if you have <clears throat> the color here, let's put the mix over the color, yeah? And let's put this same node on the mix and let's do the same here. You will have a single color, like a single um, wood floor now, like this is very boring, but if you add a color ramp or an RGB curve here and go down with it, you will start seeing like this kind of floor will be um, stained. And you have an infinity way to add details, scratches, whatever you have, whatever you found. So what I can recommend is to have a big library of alpha maps that's, or I don't know, like dirty or smudges or stains, whatever you have, scratches as well, to, to start preparing every, every asset, every, um, every floor, every, every wall, every roof, every chair, whatever you prepare, you should do this kind of work with each asset. When you see, when you post your work and your work is not as good as you think it will be, or it, not, it doesn't have like the traction that you think it should have, maybe start thinking about this, thinking, okay, did I put the effort that I should put on, on each asset that I created? Because as, you, as we know, whenever you, we post something in online, people will scroll your, your work, like, and it will be two seconds, maybe three seconds. Like it will do, okay, this is awesome, and it will go away. I think that those seconds needs to be like the result or the product of how many hours you spent on that work. So for example, if you spend 10 hours, like a half of a second is okay. If you spend 100 hours, you will get three seconds. I'm sure. I'm sure you will have three seconds, you know? And three seconds is a lot. I mean, I, I don't even spend three seconds in nothing now. So spend as much as you can on each asset and tell the story that you need to, st I mean, now you can see this is, was randomness and this was not okay because I just put stains there. What you should do is you maybe can create some painting like with the hand, paint, um, hand painting on the, on, the, on the doors or maybe you can use something like um, our friend. This is very good. You can go here and use ambient occlusion. If you use ambient occlusion, what you will see is you will have like a little map between the, what happens? Between the, do, the wall and the floor, you will start seeing like a little map. You can go to a color ramp and you can make that appear, right? So what we have learned so far, this can be a mask now. So let's put, now I'm just improvising, so. Uh, let's just put this um, mask of stains there, in that part between the wall and, and the floor. How can that be done? Okay, let's use this uh, mask, or this map as a mask, 
So I will put it here. To see it clearly, let's put black and white. OK, so now we know that if we put anything, any texture on the first lot, it will be here. And the other texture in the second lot will be here. So we can try to use the same principle that you, we used before. Let's remove this. And you can go here and here, right? So now, if you go on the color RGB curve and you go down, you will have just the entire mask there, right? So now the mask is, in this case, is on the other side. We should work on the first one, right? So in this one. So you have the stains there. Now you just need to put the, the, the stains uh, pattern on that uh, instead of that kind of thing. So how can we do that? <clears throat> we should combine with a mix this stain here, right? And now we just we want to isolate this part. And how can we do that? OK. If this is white and this is black, and now we'll do a, a mathematical operation here. If I go on the mix, this will be 0 for the mask, and this will be um, 1. It will be the, the pattern, the stain pattern. But what we can do is I can invert this like this. I will have white and black, and then I can multiply whatever I'm seeing on the other map. And when, multi when the multiplication uh, begins, let me, yeah, like this, we will just have the stains there. And we can define how strong that stain is. We can even change how this is interpolated with maybe anise. And like this, we can just isolate whatever we have there. And if we now put this here, I mess it up again because now we have white and black. Okay, so now white is down. We can start to see the stains there, and we can also try to put this on the roughness map, and the roughness map will be also like this, and you will see the stains there. I mean, it's not even noticeable. I'm, I'm no, that I spent a lot of time on something that you won't see, but I see. And that's the important <laughs> part, you know, that I am seeing it, and I am loving it, and this pixel is mine. So <laughs> do you have any question? Can we wrap it up? Because we start three minutes earlier, and I don't have anything else to say. It's OK? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching and for assisting. <laughs>